Hello, my name is Austin Belzner, and welcome back to the Austin B Media Podcast. But before we get into the podcast, I got to tell you how you can support my work. The way I find my work, whether it be a review of a movie I rent or paying for Zoom, my Patreon is the way you can help offset those costs. Patrons like MB Labula, Brian Scuttle, Joseph Davis of Sif Hop, Matthew Simpson of Blossom Friday, Tom Blackburn, and more all help to make episodes like this possible. So thank you to all you lovely patrons out there. Beyond financial support, you get some pretty sweet perks in exchange for that financial support. Whether you're into 24-hour early access to my reviews and this podcast, monthly surveys, giving direct feedback, commentaries, and just about everything in between, consider becoming a patron for as low as $1 a month at patreon.com slash austinbmedia. You can also save 16% off if you decide to subscribe annually. On top of that, it, if you're not ready to subscribe for whatever reason, you can get a seven-day free trial for every single tier I offer, even the more expensive ones. So with that, I hope you enjoy the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Austin Bay Media Podcast. Uh, today, I'm going to be discussing Gareth Edwards' latest film, The Creator, with my guest, my first ever return guest, uh, Emmanuel, Emmanuel Pagan Collins. Um, so welcome back to the podcast, Emmanuel. Um, tell everyone what you've been working on since our Cocaine Bears discussion. Yeah, so thank you so much for the invitation, Austin. So right now, I'm working with El Nuevo Dia, which is a local newspaper it is widely known in the Caribbean, and so it is passed. It is part of my master's degree, like practice, and so basically, I was working on this topic about why do local films, in the case of Puerto Rico, why our films are not going to streaming, and so I interviewed a couple of directors and people that are higher up in the movie world here in Puerto Rico. So that's something I'm working on and that I hopefully by the end of the month, it's going to be published in the newspaper. Yeah, that's awesome. Gosh, I'm trying to think of what Puerto Rican movies I've seen recently. I want to say this was a few years ago. I don't know if it was Puerto Rican or not. El Profugo, which English, the English title was The Intruder. It might be Spanish language, though. Yeah, uh, it might not be Puerto Rican film, but yeah, that's a huge problem that I see going on. It, just in the um, foreign language space as a general is even there's a Sundance film uh, a few uh, years ago. I think I talked about it a little bit on my TIFF podcast with Thomas Stoneham Judge of uh, For Real. The there was a Russian film Prime Time that took forever to get bought by Netflix at Sundance. It was really weird. But I'm glad that came out. I know a lot of more movies are coming out. I know Mubi is buying up a lot, especially as we go into the award season. I think they have How to Have Sex and a few others. But yeah. what are a few examples of, of these Puerto Rican titles? Well, the um, okay, so Blue Beetle, we consider it a Puerto Rican film because it was mostly filmed in the island. You know, let's oh, really? say. Yeah, they were here for a couple of months. The director, Angel Manuel Soto, is he was born and raised in Puerto Rico. I actually got to meet him and, you know, talk about the whole streaming move. And La Pecera, The Fishbowl, which debuted this year at Sundance, that's a yeah. film. And for me, it goes into my top five films, Puerto Rican films, because it tells our story in a way that it feels real, it's authentic, and it draws from real life events, you know. And so trying to think of, okay, so there's Gina J, which is a Disney Plus series that was canceled from Disney Plus because of a uh, tax write-off. But that mm. show was filmed completely in Puerto Rico during the pandemic, and it featured a lot of uh, Puerto Rican cast members and people behind the scenes. Uh, basically, uh, many of the Fast and Furious movies, not many, but Fast Five was filmed in Puerto Rico. And sometimes yeah. they have come to, to film uh, things from Netflix and other shows here in Puerto Rico. For example, um, Cobra Kai, the fourth season, the part where they go to Mexico, that's filmed entirely in Puerto Rico, you know? Interesting. But yeah, I've been meaning to see La Pacera. Is La Pacera how you pronounce it? Yeah, La Pacera, the fishbowl. You can say the fishbowl. It's okay. Don't worry. Yeah. I think I got a few emails about that movie. 
or something like that. But yeah, I, I need to see that movie. Uh, uh, there's a lot of those PBS actually buys for their POV series that I'm really interested to see. There's one There's one POV short, or I don't know if it's short or a docu feature, but there's one I'm checking out at New Fest that I'm really excited to see. But yeah, with that, before we get into talking about the creator, is there anything outside of that movie you want to maybe talk about, give a shout out to? I want to give a shout out to Erase Una Vez en el Caribe. In English, it's Once Upon a Time in a, in the Caribbean. It's a film that's going to come out um, the 12th of October here in Puerto Rico. It's basically imagine like Puerto Rico in the 1700s but mixed with like classic Japanese movies. So it's got a whole in interesting dynamic going on. So I'm going to send you a trailer, you know, so you can uh, put yeah, pictures awesome. and stuff. Yeah, and it's very interesting because it's one of the first times here in Puerto Rico where we see that mix of telling our story, but mixing it it up with Japanese uh, culture, you know, all that samurai stuff. So it's really interesting, yeah. Yeah, I'll be uh, interested to see that trailer and maybe checking it out if it comes uh, to my area or even if I just get a screener. Or So it, it, the fact that something would come to me is virtually impossible. But with that, let's move into our discussion of the creator. We're going to try to keep this as non-spoilery as possible, but given feel like if we dip into spoilers we'll just give a little warning like hey this is we're yeah. about to talk about a spoiler or something like that because i watched it on monday a couple of days ago and i i kept thinking to myself how are we gonna talk about this on the podcast without spoiling a lot of things just even rudimentary things so so first, everyone who listens to the podcast knows the deal. I ask a few questions, but really, I just come up with new ones all the time. So, but first, as usual, I guess, what were your expectations for the creator? They were pretty high. You know, Gareth Edwards came from Rogue One. It is one of my favorite Star Wars spinoff movies. So it held to a high regard and also the trailer it, it looked really amazing. I really like sci-fi, so that was calling to me, and I just wanted to see how my mind was going to be blown away. Yeah, it 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 really it, it really called to me because I when I watched the trailer, it was one of those where I had to see a trailer because I'm like, okay, what is Gareth Edwards doing here? Because for those who don't know, the original title of the movie is completely different. It was True Love was the original title. But I got some Godzilla 2014 and Rogue One vibes, especially uh, with some of the action scenes uh, that we'll talk about. But yeah, it, it was an interesting mix and something uh, that I think he's not quite done before. You know, he with Godzilla, he did here. What would happen if a, a fire, bre a plasma breathing monster who's powered by nuclear power? just happened to drop in the middle of San Francisco in 2014. What, how would society react? What would be the devastation? And then Rogue One, and I know he's done other movies. I'm just kind of yeah. giving my own kind of like what I've seen him do. Yeah. But in Rogue One, it was different to the point of, okay, you everyone knows how this ends. Yeah. They're stealing the plants of the Death Star. They're not mentioned in episode four or A New Hope or Star Wars, however, whatever title you want to attribute yeah. to it. They're, they're not even talked about. In fact, the line in A New Hope is a great deal of Bothans died to give us this information, which isn't the case now. Anyways, it's weird. Yeah. It's weird. Yeah. There's no defeating the Empire and uh, something that kind of gets expanded on now with stuff like Ahsoka, the Bad Batch and stuff like that really kind of created the new, I would say the new era of Star Wars outside of the Skywalker trilogy. Yeah. Or what is it called? Skywalker Saga. Skywalker, Skywalker Saga. Man. But yeah, so he's trying to do something new here that I thought was just outside of that. That, oh, hey, what if I did this super topical thing about what if... A and I don't think this is a spoiler, 
what if AI nuked LA and we went to war with them? What would that situation be like? And I think 2055 is the year this takes place yeah, in. That's the year, yeah. Yeah, so it's just kind of, I, I, I don't know, it's outside of his wheelhouse where it's trying to be a real topic kind of thing rather than, oh, hey, this is the franchise movie that everyone kind of has a... Yeah, so what I really like about the, the creator is that it felt like we're watching into the future up to some point, you know, because... 2055 is not that far away, but we also know a couple of movies that tend to go into the future, tend to get a dive into what maybe humanity could look like in the future. To me, watching that creator, I was like, in a couple of years, this is going to look like a documentary, possibly, you know, because it everything just feels so connected to what we're living in now that in certain points of the movie, I was actually terrified because I was like, what if this is the future, you know? If the future is, you know, like mm -hmm. living in a futuristic world that's controlled by AI. And so humans are trying to somehow survive in those conditions. You know, it's a bit terrifying. Yeah, for sure. I could definitely see that. But yeah, I think it's very realistic in that tone where it's not trying to be anything too fanciful although i think at times it does get oh here's like shades of elysium or district nine and i'm like okay yeah. i don't need i i don't need the fanciful because you're trying to do something real here and i guess before we get into the meat and potatoes of the story i guess let's dive into our overall thoughts on the films likes and dislikes yeah so for me, it was just a highly entertaining movie. As I said, I love sci-fi. For me, sci-fi is my bread and butter. Although the movie at some points tends to stretch out the story a little bit, which is my main critique with the film, I just liked watching how the character of John David Washington, which is named Joshua, goes on this hero's journey, you know, and... He's trying to accomplish two things, which I'm not going to go into full detail because it will be kind of spoiler zone. But basically, it's this hero's journey mixed with what's going on with the future of the world, you know. And overall, it's highly enjoyable. I enjoyed Hans Simmer's soundtrack. Overall, it's my favorite sci-fi movie of the year. It's just amazing. You know, it's interesting you mentioned Hans Zimmer because I, if you would have told me this was a Hans Zimmer score while I was watching it, I would not have believed you. I thought I would have thought this was maybe Michael Giacchino or someone like that because it's just so, I don't know, unrecognizable uh, stylistically um, to I, me. What, what I felt was that it was more nuanced than what we're accustomed to Hans Zimmer's work. Like here, he's not trying to stand out so much. He's just trying to fill the gap for the characters up to some point. Like in other hands, Simmer's soundtrack, we tend to recognize his style because the music overcomes the film up to a certain point. But here it's like, we're just trying to buy, you know, we're just trying to go with the flow of what the story mm -hmm. is. And I know the film could have been so much different and maybe would have been Hans Simmer's all the way up to level 10. But I think that it would have done a bit of disservice to the story and the characters, you know. But I totally yeah. understand your, your comment, yeah. Yeah, um, but with that, I, you know, I think I, I'm of the same mind of you with my feelings of the film. All I'll say is, in terms of runtime, is I think the, I feel like the hour that could have been cut from this movie I yeah. feel like could have been put at the front of the movie, giving more detail on who Joshua is so that when we have that hero's journey that you're talking about, it's not so confusing. Yeah, I, I mean, um, uh, yeah. when we get to the part of learning who Joshua is, we're basically getting little bits of information. We're not getting the whole story. I feel that Gap Edwards wanted the character to a certain extent remain a mystery 
and we could compare it with Tenet. You know? Tenet was also a film that we get to bits very and comparable bits to Tenet. Back, you know, and it's also with John David. So I guess that Gareth Edwards says, okay, here less is more in terms of character because we also don't learn that much about Maya, which is played by Gemma Shang. And even though at the end of the movie we get a better picture, we still don't know the whole story, which I guess we could chalk it up to a show don't tell because many of the details we learn are by uh, telling us, okay, so this happened and this happened. So that's why things are happening the way they are today, you know? Yeah, and then like certain things happen towards, and I'm not going to get too into spoilers, but the Certain things are revealed that I think work retrospectively better if you don't do that. I, it was just a little thing where I'm like, you know, to, for this moment to have the impact it does, I feel like it's kind of hamstringing itself by having us not, by having it, kind of the audience having it in a way, just like Tenet. Yeah, I, I feel that up to a certain point, what we're watching in the creator is modern storytelling like if you want to say okay so what is the actual state and i'm saying that because i'm quoting chris tuckman which he did a review on the creator and he was like okay so this is what's going on right now with you know storytelling or, or filmmaking you know which is that the creator is a movie that was made for 80 million dollars it looks better than many blockbusters movie we have seen this year. And not only that, um, they use a, on a camera that in terms of Hollywood, it's not that expensive, you know? So I guess that there's a lot of factors going into it that actually make the whole movie even more compelling, you know? Yeah, and... You know, I think he shot on the FX3, the Sony FX3, and which is like a three thousand dollar camera versus the thirty thousand uh, camera. But, but yeah, I definitely think that my qual, my whole deal was, I think, and obviously not going into spoilers. Although I may, we may dive into it a little bit later, yeah. so that the people who haven't seen it uh, can, you know, bow out in this movie. Uh, wouldn't have worked as well if he had done it that way. But yeah, that's my overall thoughts on the film. Let's see. So I think a big part of this movie is the acting. So it's very character focused. Almost not. I, I don't want to say almost to a fault, but but it it much more so than your average sci-fi movie. Yeah. So how did you feel about the acting, especially Madeline Una you know, Boyles, who plays? Alfie. Yeah, so as far as acting goes, I'm just going to go out and say that I'm a really big fan of John David Washington. I wasn't a fan of his before because sometimes the roles he would get wouldn't allow him to be to show that much range. But two things that helped me get on track with his acting was Malcolm Emery, which is a Netflix film with Zendaya. It's in black and white. It's basically both of the characters talking all the way. And it's just amazing. So if you're into that type of movie, go ahead and watch that. And also last year, I got to watch in New York, The Piano Lesson, which is also going to be a Netflix Netflix film. And he was one of the main actors. And he just showed so much range in that play that I was amazed at what uh, we weren't getting from John David Washington on the screen. And I feel that with the creator, we're much closer to getting that full range of acting, you know. And I will dare say it, I love Denzel Washington as an actor, but I feel that John David is already beyond you know, above his father in terms of acting. And I just want to see more of John David on the screen. I also have to talk about um, Gemma Shan, which she's also very lovely. She does very uh, fearless, that character. And I enjoy it so much. The chemistry between them is amazing. And in terms of Madeline, which is the, you know, the actual question, 
she was just great, you know. I feel that as far as actings go, it's real good. I like her dynamic with Joshua. Uh, you know, even though I have said it time and time again, it reminded me a lot to The Wolf and the Cop. You know, that's a classic Japanese film. You know, it's actually a series, but I'm actually referring to, to like, the, the whole franchise. And it also reminded me of Mandalorian and Grogu, you know, that type of dynamic, too, which is also based on The Wolf <laughs> and the Cop. Yeah. Yeah, I'll echo your sentiments with John David Washington. I I'll, And I'll echo uh, the recommendation for Malcolm and Marie. It wasn't the best film, partially because of the script, but Zendaya and uh, John David Washington, that's their showpiece. If you want, if, if that's not part of their acting reel, it should be. I feel like I've seen him in something else since too, but I, for, I forget what it was. He's really good in it, probably the best of his career so far. Um, and definitely, like you said, I would say better than Denzel Washington, especially recent uh, Denzel Washington movies than Madeline. Let's see. She's great. I feel like she almost carries the movie in a way. I mean, the, the story um, doesn't go that far without her. So that's why it feels like that. Yeah, I guess I just meant in terms of like placing all the emotional burden Oh yeah, uh, of the story. Uh, yeah, um, because there's just so much emotion that this little kid, I, I'm guessing she's probably eight or nine when this was filmed um, or, or somewhere around that. And, and you're asking her to display all these complex emotions like uh, grief, uh, blank, uh, I mean, blank facedness at, at one point. Um, uh, but yeah, she does great, especially towards the ending. Uh, yeah, that. I, I feared a little bit with the trailers that I was going to hate her acting because there's a line, I won't say when it is in the movie, but the quote is the this person with pink purple hair asks her what do you want? And she says for robots to be free. And when I saw that, in the when I heard that in the trailer, I was just like, oh no, it's going to be one of those kid acting movies. And I was just like, and I was pleasantly surprised that when this came up is it wasn't just like a it was treated as a joke. Um, yeah, I, like I it would that, be. I feel that the, the trailers don't do a disservice to the film because, yeah. for example, that line, it's really powerful in the film. And, and in the trailer, it kind of, it comes across kind of like a joke because then you're like, oh, wait, so this is going to be a whole movie about her saying, oh, we want to be free, you know, and all that stuff. But actually, when you watch the movie and she says that line, a couple of times it actually makes sense and even got me crying at one point because when they're asking her that she was basically you know about to cry because it was a struggle you know and it's the whole movie makes you feel what she felt you know even though she's an ai with the face of a girl yeah but she was really good in it i hope i don't think supporting actress but if there's like a young actress or or new actress category, I think she makes a strong case for being in that category at whatever award would take it. I don't think it, this would be Spirit Awards because it's over the seventy five million, but because they have a seventy five million dollar budget cap on all films, um, but it's crazy that it, this movie even comes close to that. Um, but then uh, Jimmy Chan. Um, I, I don't think she was in it enough for me to really get a sense of her. Um, I'll just say she was better than she was in Eternals um, and in anything else I've seen. So, I mean, that's at least saying something. Um, Allison Janney, probably best performance I've seen her in. Um, like, she does some things in this movie that probably got the strongest reactions out of me because I was just like, oh my, what are you doing? Yeah. Same with Ken Watanabe. He has a line late in the film that I won't spoil for those listening without seeing the movie. Uh, I'll talk about it later on, maybe when we get into spoiler talk. But there's a line that I was like, oh, that is really probably the line of the film. 
that meant that just clarifies the, the thesis of the film. Other than that, shout out to Ralph Ineson just because of his voice. I knew immediately. I'm like, okay, Ralph Ineson, you got me. You, you got me in into this movie. But yeah, I thought all the acting was really well done. John David Washington's probably the highlight for me, uh, along with Madeline Yuna. Yeah, as far as the acting goes, uh, I feel that this is one of those movies that we're going to be able to, you know, watch time and time again because it is both well act, you know, it has well, it has great acting, but it also has a great, a good script, you know, so it's, I feel like this is one of the better movies that we're going to see in the next few years because we're also, you know, if, and this is going outside a little bit of the creator, but if you look at the actual state of uh, Hollywood, how many movies do you think we're actually going to quote in the next 10 years? You know, it's probably going to be Barbie, maybe Mario, maybe the creator, you know, that type of stuff. I'm definitely not going to be, well, I, I've already started quoting Mario in, in memes. It's like... yeah, but it's still, uh, what I'm saying is that we, we have to also pay attention to the type of movies that are going to be culturally significant, you know? I feel like that creator right now it, it may not do that, but it's I feel it's gonna be like a Scott program where it took him a couple of years to actually get the recognition and become the name it is right now. And they're also making a, a Scott program anime series, you know, and it's been like what more than so 10 cool. years. Yeah, I know it's cool, but I feel like the creator is not gonna get that much love right now, but maybe in a few years we're all gonna be talking about it. Yeah, I guess talking on that topic, I, this kind of ties into my overall thoughts on the film and something I actually forgot to mention. Um, but I think this is going to be, I think it's actually going to have a trajectory more like Mother, um, where the more people like, I I think that I will be higher on this movie once I see it again. Like, I feel like it's a movie you have to watch multiple times yeah, to really sit with. Agree. Especially with some of the stuff that happens later uh, in the film. Yeah, no, uh, I totally agree. I, I watched it two times. And on the second time, I got to understand a lot more of the relationship between Alfie, which is played by Malin, and uh, Gemma Chan, which she plays Maya in the film. Like, there's a connection there. You know, I won't go into details, but you get to understand sure. it better on the second watch, you know? And I feel like we're at the point of almost going to the spoiler zone, so I'm just going to you know, stop talking right now. Yeah. This is literally my last thing before we uh, talk about spoilers because I feel like because I feel like the next question I have, I can't talk about without talking about spoilers. Yeah. So I guess for those who maybe haven't seen the movie, Let's give our final rating so that they can go out and, you know, <laughs> skip out and then come back to this later when they've seen it. You go first, Emmanuel. So for me, it's a 9 out of 10. As I said, the script, oh. I mean, the duration of the movie is a bit longer than I needed it to be. But so far, it's my favorite sci-fi film of the year. I still won't say it's the best of the few, last few years because... I want to watch it a third time and like reassess, but so far it's up there. You know, it's pretty high on the sci-fi list. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm about to upset everyone with my ranking. So I do stars out of five stars, but I'll convert it to the out of 10. So on my star scale, it would be three out of five for me. Okay which is 60%. There's just some things that I'll talk about when we get into spoilers that became painfully obvious to the point where I was like kind of bored for everything after, well, after the second, well, I can't say what it is, but- But it's after the second- there, There's something that after like a certain point in the film, I just, I see where this is going. Okay. Uh, it kind of got predictable after that for me. Because I tend to, while I'm watching a movie, this happened to me with Arrival, too. So for me, what happened with Arrival, for those who don't know, I've talked about this a lot, but in case you're not aware, I tend to think 
while I'm watching a movie to the point I tend to overthink because I figured out the twist and arrival 10 minutes in. Wow. And I figured out the twist to the creator, or the, not the twist, but how the movie ends a few months ago. Okay. So when I came into the theater, I'll just say that I knew things were going to happen and the, and my suspicions were confirmed. So I was like, oh man, it would have been really cool if he zagged instead of zigged and defied my expectations because I feel like it's really cool when directors don't do the obvious thing. That's all I have to say without getting into direct spoilers. I mean, I feel like I'm teetering on the edge there. Yeah, as far as what you're saying about the plot, I kind of, I get it. Because sometimes as movie lovers or, you know, people that love cinema, we tend to overanalyze stuff. So we try to get to a nitty gritty before the movie happens. It also has happened to me. In terms of the creator, I feel that the more, let's say, convoluted or the more twist you gave it to the movie, it might actually lose the public. You know, it, it, let's talk about Tenet. Tenet subverted expectations. So that's one of the, the, let's say, biggest reasons why a lot of people didn't like the movie because one thing is trying to like do a twist. And I know that twist can be a good thing in the story, but we also have M. Night Shyamalan, which is famous for his twist. And sometimes we don't like them because it probably changes the whole dynamic, you know? So I, I feel that in some cases, yeah. maybe going the obvious route is better in terms of you know, the whole, you're trying to get people to understand your concept. If you, maybe you change it too much, you're going to get people lost on what you're trying to say. And I felt like Garrett Edwards had the chance to maybe go that route you're saying, but maybe he understood, yeah. okay, I want everybody to get this loud and clear. So maybe that was, you know, the route to go, but I totally understand your point because at points for someone that loves films, it might get tiring you know for example if you watch the mag you're like okay this is sharknado this is jaws this is so many other films and you're just like well let's just you know enjoy it you know yeah and i will say i'm probably like in the vast minority when it comes to overthinking when i'm in a movie where i'm like where i'm like oh did the thing happen that i thought was gonna happen and literally, I don't know a person who does that. So I'm I'm in the vast minority when it comes to this. So it's like more of a niche, like kind of pet peeve yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. And uh, I, I just want to yeah. give a, a quick quote from a professor that gave me social studies and in college, he basically said, so sorry, it was social sciences, sorry, social sciences. He said, we're basically watching the same story. It's cowboys versus Indians all the time. We're just switching the characters, you know? And if you think about it, Star Wars is cowboys in space. Yeah. So we're just changing that, that dynamic, but it's this, oh, that movie reminds me to so so or such and such. So with that, I think that kind of concludes our spoiler-free discussion because I think everything I really want to talk about has to do with spoilers. So if you haven't seen the film, check out, you know, go watch the movie. My pack, my screening at 12.30 on a Monday was absolutely empty, so besides two or three people. So you'll be able to find seats unfortunately i wish it maybe had done it's doing a little better but but go check it out i'll have a link in the description to buy tickets or eventually when it comes out on digital and blu-ray that same link should take you to the blu-ray or digital copy um so with that let's get into spoilers uh yeah. first i want to talk about what did you think of the story and how gareth edwards divides the narrative into chapters I actually love that because it is, he's basically trying to give us the Japanese vibes, you know, for example, Very. Yojimbo, 
the wolf and the cop. Tarantino also has that style. So I think he's just trying to do a tribute to the movies he loved, you know? I feel like, it, for me, it worked so well. It gave me also, like, a space to grieve. Because yeah. if you watch the story at times, may not feel like it's one story. If not, it's four stories, basically, three or four stories into one. So, Yeah, I'll echo what you said about this uh, breathing space. Because when, I guess, the title card or chapter card... Yeah hits you're like okay now it's time to move on to a new thing and i feel like the modern equivalent of that would be like moscow 19, or, or whatever you know yeah. in civil war when they're like queens new york but in this it's oh hey we've cut to black it's you know the creator the child the mother i think the father or something like that anyways and you know it's just a very clean cut okay audience now we're moving into a new section of the story. Let's here. Here's a clean break. When directors put it in chapters, because I think that really does really sell. Okay, it doesn't feel as long because if I need to go back and like maybe watch it again, I'm like, okay, what did I think about the creator chapter of the movie? What did I think of the mother chapter? You know, stuff like that. It makes it a lot easier to do that kind of scrubbing. Yeah, and I also feel that in terms of the, the movie as, as it is, it's really hard to tell the whole story without doing the chapters, you know, because people are going to be lost. Yeah. And some other movies we have watched in the past tend to do that mistake where they don't leave a breathing room for them. So sometimes you can get lost with the story. Tenet, I feel like it could have better finished benefited from maybe have, having title cards you know stuff like yes. that so much I, I was thinking about tenant while i was watching this movie a little bit just because it's at, so at points it does feel a little similar yeah uh, especially with some of the stuff that happens i can't remember anything specifically uh, otherwise i'd say something but i was just like man this feels so similar to tenant at points and i'm like I hope it executes, but but yeah, it would have really benefited from that chapter kind of format where it was like the art, art, art dealer or whatever. Yeah, and also it's the fact that the creator, I feel like it's trying to be as most, let's say it's trying to be the story, you know, like it's not trying to go way too over your head. Yeah, at some points the movie does feel dense, and I feel that's part of the nature of storytelling sometimes. But I feel yeah. like the movie tries to be like really bare bones if uh, you want to say it like that. Yeah, it, it tries to let you make your own conclusions instead of forcing you to make what the conclusions you, you it wants you to make. Although it does do the latter thing at a few points where it's like, hey, what do you think about this? And I'm like, okay, I, I get it. I get it. I get what you're trying to say to me. But with that, how did you feel about how this movie handled AI and like the intersection between that and how humans interacted with AI and everything like that? Well, in terms of the AI for me, it's a, it's really starting to go to a really interesting area because the movie at some point, it shows that the AI wanted to not you know, wanted to have a connection with the humans. And for me, one thing that I will, I would like to see, but I know it's not going to happen, is that they just say at one point in the movie, oh, you know, the bomb wasn't sh supposed to go off. That was the line I was going to talk about, where, oh gosh, Ken Watanabe's character, Harun? Harun, Harun, yeah. Yeah, the line of the movie for me is, you know what would happen if we won this war? Absolutely nothing. Yeah, and for me, the movie draws a line in terms of uh, human involvement with AI. I feel that, yes, at some point, we're just going to have to live with AI. I feel like we're just getting there. But right now, I am one of those people that's a bit, you know, I don't really, at the moment, enjoy 
discussing the topic of AI because I know it's going to get out of control at some point. We're yeah. already seeing the effects. You know, we're already seeing how it's getting all out of hand with certain topics. We're getting people that they're using their voice for AI. So they're trying to draw conversations that never happened, you know. And right now, we're not as scared because AI is still imperfect, you know. Yeah. But And it's still discernible to a certain extent. For example, last night, I was seeing a conversation that never happened. But I knew that conversation was fake because of two things. One, the tone of the voice of the people that were talking. At some points, the inflections would be way different than the actual persons. And the other one was the structure of the dialogue, you know, because... The dialogue sometimes in AI sounds like a bit too unrealistic. So like a run on sentence almost. Yeah, yeah. And it's also the fact that sometimes it talks in a way that makes people who are not charismatic sound charismatic, you know, which is weird. But exactly. I just feel like we're going to a place where AI is going to be all over us. And we're not going to be able to do anything about it because we're not going to be in control anymore, you know? And there's a line in the movie that Alison Janey says that what happened with the Neanderthals? Well, basically, a more ruthless species attacked them, you know, and took yeah. over. And I feel like AI is going to go to a point where they're basically going to say what we're going to do and we're not going to have a say in it. You know, That's my worry. Yeah, I, I'm definitely worried about that, which is why I, I try to keep an eye on it, because, you know, I, I saw last night there was a news article saying that someone was advertising, I don't know who, advertising like an iPhone 15 giveaway with Mr. Beast's voice. And Mr. Beast himself, I think Johnny is his name, um, him, came him. out and was like, I never recorded this. This is ridiculous. And, you know... Spotify, where this podcast is hosted on, experimenting, and I think YouTube too, is experimenting with like auto translate, where it'll take my voice and make it convert it to different languages, even with using the original recording. But I don't know, doing some AI stuff to it, and it's weird. Yeah, and let's not go. Let's not go that far. Yeah, most studios, well, some studios right now are using AI to do subtitles. Yeah. Because I've seen a couple of series get the sub AI. So they're not paying somebody to double check if it's written right. You know, and I heard about some studios having that problem with their shows that sometimes some words don't get the subtitles right, you know? And it it's gonna be a problem, you know. Yeah, for example, my creative workflow for this very podcast and for a lot of my videos is I put this into Descript, which is uses AI to analyze everything we're saying right now or everything that's put in the video from the file and tries to create a subtitle for it. But even then, I'm at least comfortable because at least then I'm like, okay, I go, I have to go back and correct it and say, hey, I said this. You know, it really has... A uh, tough time with. I'm just gonna give it a tough time right now. If I say Austin B Media, it will put Austin V Media. Yeah. Or if I say Neurodivergent, it doesn't know what that man- means at all. Uh, it tries to make a different word. But anyways, yeah, I I, I 100% the whole thing with AI subtitles because I deal with it. So and have to really do a lot of maneuvering to get it to. A correct point, which I'm glad Descript is, you know, doing a thing where I can actually correct it and say, hey, here's where you made the errors. Here's where you need to uh, correct yourself and stuff like that. But yeah, fingers crossed the Terminator revolution does the Skynet revolution does not happen. Yeah. Uh, And I guess transitioning to a more I I don't want to say more serious topic. But with something I caught during the film, well, I, I guess I'll ask, what was the allegory 
for the conflict between AI and humans for you? What allegory do you think Gareth Edwards was going for? What real life thing do you think he was trying to uh, parallel there? I mean, I saw the notes, so I know where you're going with. Okay. I feel like it's more of man versus society kind of thing. Okay. Because I feel that the humans got, as in most movies do, got greedy. You know, they wanted to let know the AI they were in control. And mm -hmm. at, at a certain point, I just feel that Garrett Edwards was trying to voice his own position with AI up to a certain point. And what were the, the costs and the effects of that? But yeah, I just, the main overtone I got with this movie is that Gareth Edwards, and I will say, I do think he was inserting himself kind of into the story a little bit and saying, here's what I think about AI. But what I was thinking about in the entire film, especially the first time we go to, I believe it's New Asia. There's a certain like yeah. area of New Asia. Yeah. No. Where all, where all, all these AI and simulants are hanging out in a perfect harmony yeah. with humans. And it's this night mission that John David Washington goes on. And a, I, I guess, robot looks up at the flying vehicle. I don't think they ever say what it is yeah. or what vehicle, vehicle it is. As he's working a rice paddy, and I immediately, from that point on, I was thinking of the Vietnam War. Especially with what Alice and Janney does in this movie. And some of the things that happened in that night mission where people are like taking off faces and just, you know constantly disregarding the AIs and simulants as the it gets it kind of into the subject of the other or othering um, quite a bit. And I just couldn't get that out of my mind the entire movie. I was just like, oh, wow, this is a really strong entry into the allegory of the Vietnam War in film. Yeah, and that also happens in Rogue One, you know, we yeah. could see that the last uh, battle, which happens at the beach, that's also another, you know, allegory. And in the case of uh, the creator, to me, the, the part that gets me a little bit, you know, nervous is that most of the explosions look way too real, you know. It, it reminds me of the Christopher Nolan joke. No, we're yeah. actually going to detonate a bomb. You know, and I read somewhere, I don't remember, I can't remember right now that one of the explosions from the creator is actually from the Vietnam War. So that actually goes into your allegory, you know, that this is the story of Vietnam just played out on a AI driven landscape, you know? Yeah, because, and I think especially with this movie taking place in Asia, I think that it's not lost on, that the allegory is not lost. Um, but yeah, I just, and I'm probably using the wrong term. Allegory probably isn't the right term for that. Um, but it, it was just so prevalent throughout the film. But speaking of the missiles, um, I, I want your opinion on something. Yeah. It, it doesn't matter overall in my opinion, but yeah. actually on two, this is a two-parter. First, did you initially think, I don't know how much research you did, before this movie, before watching the movie. But did you initially think that Nomad was going to be controlled by AI at some point in this movie? Well, I didn't do that. Or like part of it or something. I don't know. Yeah. So let me start by saying that I most, I tend to mostly do research before a movie. If I kind of know about the, the topic in this case, since I didn't want to get spoiled, you know, I just, only watch the trailers and try to mount or do okay maybe so this is this could be the plot you know all i knew it was that at some point yeah it would get connected you know because up to a certain point as i said earlier on this is the same story about cowboys and indians and this movie also reminded me a lot to avatar you know so yeah we're just getting a lot of uh, the beats that we're seeing on other movies, but it's through a different voice, you know, because it's, for example, what's the point of remakes? 
the point of remakes is sometimes adapting stories that we already know into a more modern setting, you know? So I just feel that this movie tried to do a story that we already had seen, but in another setting, in another voice, you know? So that that was at least my, my point of view, yeah. Yeah, it, it, at certain points, it does feel almost Terminator-esque towards the end, with Shades of iRobot, actually. Yeah. Which is kind of interesting. But the second part to that question was, like, they never clarify what those Nomad missiles are. Are they nukes? Or did you get the impression they were nukes? To me, I feel like the missiles are not that important because okay. Gareth yeah. Edwards is not trying to tell us, like, what brand are they, you know, made of. To him, it's more important about showing the destruction. But as far as movie logic goes, I would just say it's a nuke, you know. Yeah, because Joshua goes back to his house and it's the same kind of nomad missile and it's like a nuclear wasteland. And yeah. I'm like, okay, so are these not regular missiles or are they? Let's yeah. just say they're, they're, they're uh, 2055 missiles. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I guess that would be like the, the easiest explanation. It's 25, it's 2055 missiles. They can do anything you, you think about, you know. They, they do whatever the plot requires them to do. Exactly. Oh, my God. I just love that line. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, let's we'll see. I, but yeah, I, I think it, it. Yeah, the Vietnam thing really struck me throughout the film. I do wish we got some more time with Gemma, yeah. Maya. Sorry, mm -hmm. because especially with what happens at the end of the film, with Alfie putting the memories of the previous version of Maya yeah. into into this look-alike, I, I guess would be the term. Um, Own or a replicant, if you want to use, you know, play, play I run. mean, let, let's call the simulants what they are. They're, yeah. they're replicants because they have the same, like, kind of test of, hey, we need to look at your, like, something in your, in a little circle. I'm like, okay, I got it. And for example, in the movie, there's a whole point that uh, I would have liked to see, but I know it would have made the movie a bit longer. And already that was one of my critiques but is that at some point Maya sold her um likeness to a yeah guy. and I feel like maybe that scene would have been important to watch the process of how she sells her likeness to AI. Yeah or even to just say hey she did this so that one day this thing could happen or but you know have a reason for it other than have the first time we see Maya post prologue be in a dream sequence. And then it's clarified, oh, people can have other people's faces and things like that. Because it, it, it's just like a flash and you miss it. You kind of have to almost be paying attention to realize that because the person I saw it with, um, uh, I had to clarify, no, the reason that person had that face is because people are selling faces. They're like AI scans and whatnot. I also think... Oh, yeah, the Nermada stuff could be clarified a bit more. Yeah, it's it's just one of those things where I feel like maybe he's trying to get it down under three hours. Yeah, and it's also the part that the first time I saw a movie, I was like, so uh, we get the, uh, the, at the beginning, we get the definition or the meaning, if you want to call it like that, of what is Nermada, the creator, all that stuff. But at, at a certain point, I was a bit lost because I was like, so who is the creator? Is it Alfie? Is it Maya? And, yeah. you know, that was in the first screening. In the second viewing, well, I got to understand it just a bit more, but I'm still like, I need to watch it again because the movie could be watched as a series. Yeah. It's of three episodes, and maybe that gives you even better time to process what's going on, you know? Yeah, I'd be okay with a six hour or eight hour, you know, Disney Plus show or who uh, I guess Hulu, because you couldn't do anything like this on Disney Plus. Or I guess internationally, Star would would yeah. be what it was. And just do an eight eight hour series of okay, this episode's the creator, this episode's the child, this episode's the mother, this is the father. You know, yeah. do a, pull a pull an Ahsoka. 
Yeah, and as far as what we're talking about right now, you could also touch on, for example, Alison Ganey said that one of her son died in the hands of AI. That would have been a, a really interesting scene, you know, because, I mean, she's telling us, the audience, and it's a good thing that Alison Ganey's the, the actress that she is, and we understand that scene, but I feel like maybe watching it while she was narrating, it would have been something else. Yeah, because it's funny. She mentions, like, don't get caught, and then she gets caught, and it's not a big deal. I'm like, what? Okay, if it wasn't such a big deal getting caught, why did you make such a big deal out of it? Yeah, to me, it's just standard bad guy movie trope. She reminded me a lot to Miles Quaritch in The Avatar. Basically, they make these characters up to a certain point two-dimensional but during the movie we find out they're actually three-dimensional because they have feelings they care about stuff even in her last scene you know Allison's last scene I felt that we got more out of her in that scene than in the whole movie because we understood and she understood what was going on you know so that's sometimes the importance of these characters you know yeah and, and I mean at the end of the day each character is a narrative device to get a piece of plot told. Yeah. And I guess with that, let's talk about, uh, I guess, heaven as a concept in this movie, yeah. because that's the thing I, I knew about like months ago. That's the thing I figured out. I was like, Oh, the movie is going to end with uh, Joshua having to sacrifice himself or, you know, getting to heaven somehow. It's also kind of a weird thing that they talk about it a lot the notion of i'm not a person and identity and heaven these real heavy topics and then they just don't ever gareth edwards never really explicitly spells it out in alfie and joshua's final moments he he, uh, does he say i'm going to heaven basically there's a line that it's i'm going to heaven but he says it's because of you Okay, yeah. All be, but yeah, but the thing is that the part about heaven to me it plays an important role in the movie because Joshua doesn't consider himself a good man, and that's part of the hero's journey because he understands that he's playing an undercover cop living with Maya, but he develops real feelings. But he knows that at some point he's gonna have to turn on her and her people which is a little bit like Avatar, you know? Yeah. And so the whole movie, he's trying to go on this journey, kind of like the Mandalorian, where he's trying to prove that he is a good person, you know? And I really like the scene where Alfie tells him, it's in the trailer, but it's also a really important part in the movie, where she tells him, you're not going to have him because you're not a good guy, and I'm not going to have him because I'm a... And I, an AI, you know, I'm not real. And at the end, both characters feel like they're going to heaven because they have done the good deed, you know, part of, and this is more, and I'm sorry if there are some people that don't agree with this, but in the Christian religion, you know, part of going to heaven is doing good deeds, being a good person. You know, it's also about believing in Christ, but there's no, the, the, the concept of Christ is not present throughout the whole film. So we're just relying on he, on them being good people. And basically by Joshua sacrificing himself, that is what gets him to heaven, you know? Yeah, and, and I feel like that part can't be downplayed. I wish it was more explicitly spelled out in the main narrative. Maybe, oh, I can't go to heaven because I, you know, this and this, or or something maybe where it's like more expounded upon yeah i i I just would have loved something a little bit more but i i do think the whole earning good deeds really does have a it is you can't ignore that as part of the film but what i will ignore is all the people saying no i reject that theory i no this yes there are ships in it. Yes, there is a, not planet killing, but weapon in space. But that's about where the similarities end. This is more like District 9 
mixed with Elysium or I am robot mixed with Elysium. Mm -hmm. um, and there was actually some visuals, in fact, where I was like, oh, oh, gosh, who directed um, D District 9? Neil Blomkamp? Yeah, Neil Bl Blomkamp, yeah. I was just thinking to myself, oh, Neil Blomkamp must be fuming right now. <laughs> Because yeah. it just looks so much like what District 10 would have been or District whatever the new the sequel would have been. Yeah, and also an important detail that I got on the second viewing of uh, the creator is the scene where Alfie gets at the end of the movie in a launch pod to Earth. It reminded me a lot to Superman, which is like, oh, interesting. So Earth's, Earth's protector, you know. He came from the heavens to save us because then Alfie at the end of the movie up to some point is like the protector of the AI people on Earth. See, what I got from that scene was something massively different and it ties back into Christian theolo theology. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to get theological real, yeah, really worry. quick. His a Alfie's actual name is Alpha Omega. Yeah, which, I remember that for those who haven't read the Bible, is the name Jesus, uh, I think, I believe Jesus refers himself as, or, or God refers him to as Alpha and Omega. So I think they were trying to paint Alfie as this kind of Messiah character. And this is kind of where the iRobot stuff comes in, because at the last shot of the movie is Alfie staring at the free robots, or I guess he's staring at the free robots, because we don't really get a shot of what he's looking at, yeah. or what she's looking at. But I'm assuming, I, it's probably bad, I'm assuming that Alfie, do we get a clear, is Alfie a, what gender, does Alfie have a gender in this movie? I feel like I've, I've Alfie, been saying she. Yeah, I for me, Alfie is a girl, and the thing is that as a kid, we, you know, as part of her character, we don't indulge that much into who she is. The only line I would say that proves to you she's a girl is when they're choosing the name. She says, I want to be named Candy. Mm. You know, and she goes on this whole, oh, yeah, I like Candy and all that stuff. That's a, an answer that most likely, you know, a girl will have. Okay, because I don't want gender, even though it's like a not a real person i yeah, try I to be really careful about that but alfie you know we don't get a shot of what she's looking at but it's that final shot of i robot is the same kind of thing is oh the oh who's who is it alan tudyk uh, is the voice yeah. of them and, and he's just looking out at the robots is a very similar shot and he's in that movie the messiah character the messiah robot who will lead them to the promised land which is also another thing with, but that's with Moses and uh, we could have a, a, another hour talking about the all the hidden theology in this movie. I'm sure pastors will be will be talking about this when it comes out digitally, because anytime a new Star Wars would come out, my church would do it like a here's Star Wars and theology, and the good side is the you know you know God and the good bad side of satan and stuff like that i'm sure there's a entire conversation to be had just about the theology in this movie although it does kind of convolute itself because there's monk uh, uh, buddhist imagery in when we meet yeah. uh Nir Nirmata for the first time and it's just okay this is kind of weird because you're pulling from christian the theology but now you're also pulling from buddhism it's, it's, it just gets really confusing. Yeah, for me, yeah, I don't totally understand the, your point. For me, I guess that most people will interpret it as, well, they're in New Asia, so they're probably, you know, showing us the religion that they're basically going going to, you know, go after, which is Buddhism. But um, I feel like the overarching story is a story that's tied to the Christian religion so that's why it might feel a bit like a clash but i just felt like they found a middle ground to tell both stories and you know to tell both sides of the story in one and just a, a quick fact it's like pinocchio that's a movie that's 
when you look at it, it it covers the whole Christian side of things, but it's from a Catholic point of view, which is yeah. interesting. Yeah, but I, I think that covers all my thoughts, like literally every single one of my thoughts on the movie, except for maybe the prologue, but I don't feel like that's even, that people can look at that when it comes out digitally. I don't feel like that's even worth talking about because that's more more along the lines of, here's the thesis of our movie. Yeah. And I feel like that gets into some cinema sins territory where I'm like, okay, would a, arm, where's the president? Where's, why is there an army general? What, why, what's going on? But th those are just nitpicks, not really anything we have to talk about. Um, you have anything you want to talk about with the creator? It's a really good story that I just hope gets gets more people to watch it because for me, one of the worrying things right now in terms of cinema is that a lot of people are saying, oh, we want to see more uh, original movies. You're getting them, but you're not watching them. Yeah. And then when you announce Marvel's 50th film, people are just going to go in droves to theaters. And I say that as someone that loves Marvel, Star Wars, all those big franchises, but I also want to see these stories that are not necessarily, you know, widely renowned or have these amazing characters. Like, I just want to enjoy storytelling at its finest. I feel that the audience, we as the audience, are sometimes taking the power from original filmmakers and original stories because we just want to watch what we already know, you know, and it's a bit hard. Yeah, and I will say as much as I didn't vibe with this movie, again, I only saw it one time, so maybe I'll vibe with it more a second time. In fact, my, just talking about some of the stuff we talked about, I might be tempted to go up to a 3.5, 3.5, which is about 70%, but but despite how, but despite all that, I always respect a director taking a big swing at a new thing. Um, it didn't work out so well with Pablo Lorraine with El Conde, which I talked to and Stuki about on uh, the twelfth edition of this podcast, five podcasts ago now, which is yeah. crazy. Um, but I and Cocaine Bear really didn't work, but I I still liked it. Um, and I respect all the swings what we're taking this year. I think did knock out knock at the cabin come out this year too. Yeah, knock at the cabin. It was holy cow that came out this year. Oh my yeah. goodness. Yeah, it, I think it was March or something like that. Yeah, somewhere around there. And we're getting swing. You know, reptile just came out on Netflix. Cat person, which I'm reviewing. Whole story of Henry Sugar, which I guess is kind of franchise because it's based off of a roll doll short story. Yeah, but we're getting a lot of you know big swings this year, and I think the key and stop saying for the industry websites that are not listening, but in case you are, stop saying that like a movie's box office performance is killing movie theaters or saving movie theaters. It's not helping the situation at all because if you say the creator is flopping at the box office or something, that makes people not want to see something. Uh, and I think a lot of these uh, trades have a responsibility as, you know, with a large of following that as they do THR, Deadline, Variety, and all the other yeah. ones. Elemental, as an example, this past summer, which flopped in its debut week, but it ended up making money at the end of the of its run. But what helped it was word of mouth. So, you know. Yeah. And, and I feel that's critical for original stories is that word of mouth because if people aren't talking about it, then like for Knives Out, which at the time was not a franchise, people were going out to see it. I think it came out Thanksgiving 2019 or something like that. Yeah. And people were t kept talking about it on social media or with their friends. And that's what got Knives Out to be the get a sequel, really. I, I, yeah. mean, I mean, technically not a sequel, but I mean, is the sequel a lot in the way that the Hercule Perot movies are a sequel of one another. Yeah. So, yeah, just talk. if you go see this. Well, I guess I, you have to have seen this movie if you're listening to it now, because we've talked a lot about spoilers. But I just 
talk about these movies with one another, even if it's on Letterboxd, just comment on somebody's review because I think critically or financially, a lot of these movies, I know this is like a studio movie, so-and-so, but it's also only made on an $80 million budget. Yeah. Uh, so that would be a micro budget kind of movie for a studio like that. Same thing with Chevalier earlier this year, which I feel like nobody saw until it came out digitally or on Hulu and even still. But yeah, I, I feel like word of mouth is critical and I hope people see this, even if it's when it comes out on Hulu, because you know, this movie isn't coming out on Disney plus based on its themes. This, there ain't no way unless Hulu gets integrated with Disney Plus sooner rather than later. But with that said, I want to thank everyone for listening and watching uh, this episode of the Austin B Media Podcast. I've been your host, Austin Belzer. Uh, if you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and leave a rating and review on your favorite podcast app. Uh, you can follow me on social media at Austin B Media everywhere except for X, where it is Austin B Media underscore. Because Twitter won't get, give me that won't give me that at Austin B Media handle. So with that, where can people find you online, Emmanuel? Well, it's at moviesquadpr.com. That's the website. We're also on Instagram, Twitter at moviesquadpr. Moviesquad podcast on Spotify and YouTube. And on Facebook, it's all moviesquad. Yeah. Awesome. And, uh, and I'll make sure people have links to that in the description yeah. and show notes. And I I do want to mention one thing in case I didn't mention it in the Patreon ad read. So as of recording this, new Patreon came out. They've redesigned Patreon. So I found out that the only way you can listen to this audio only, unless you do some finagling with Spotify, is the Patreon feed. So I guess that's the only way to listen to this audio only, unless you lock your phone while listening to it on Spotify or whatever. So I guess if you want the audio only, Subscribe to the Patreon in case I, I didn't say that in my Patreon ad read uh, earlier. But with that, thanks again, and I'll see you all next time. Thank you so much.